In the late summer months of 2011, a morbid story began to play out in Waltham, Massachusetts, a suburb on the western edges of Boston, just about 20 minutes away from the city of Cambridge, home to approximately 60,000 people. Waltham is a city in Middlesex County, which is comprised of a large population of university students and faculty members as well as foreign residents from all over the world. In September of 2011, the bodies of three men were found inside of the apartment of the youngest victim, at 12 Harding Avenue, in the dead-end neighborhood of Bleachery. All three were Jewish, and all were physically imposing men, who worked in career fields that demanded rigorous fitness standards. Despite the three men seeming to be the polar opposite of most murder victims, they had somehow fallen prey to a violent killer, who single-handedly murdered all three, and left the scene in a chaotic maelstrom that is still hard to parse through years later. Speaking to ABC News a couple of years later, a Waltham investigator would call this crime, quote, the worst bloodbath I have ever seen in a long law enforcement career, unquote. At the time this quote was made, unrelated events had exposed this case to an international audience. But, almost a decade later, it remains as unsolved as ever. This is the story of the 2011 Waltham Triple Murder. Raphael M. Tiken, known as Rafi to many of his friends and family members, was born on December 28, 1973. The son of a rabbi, Rafi grew up in Brookline, Massachusetts, just a few miles outside of Boston. There, he would attend Brookline High School, which he graduated from in 1992. He would later attend the predominantly Jewish Brandeis University, where he majored in history and received a bachelor's degree from in 1998. Rafi would later find work as a personal trainer, but neighbors believed that he was supplementing his income in other ways, namely as a drug dealer who dealt primarily in marijuana. He reportedly rarely left his house, but had a number of regular visitors, which had drawn suspicion. But because Rafi was such a quiet and unassuming guy, nobody really thought that he was up to trouble at the time. Loved ones would later recall Rafi as a kind spirit that spent the better part of his adulthood in the gym, and who, despite enduring a handful of personal tragedies, managed to stay out of trouble well into his 30s. Eric Hacker Weissman was born on June 19, 1980, in Boston's St. Elizabeth Hospital. Eric grew up in a very faith-driven home, and would remain involved with his local synagogue well into adulthood, and he would remain outspoken about his Jewish faith throughout his life. Having grown up in the Boston area, Eric would graduate from Cambridge Ringe and Latin School, a local high school. One of his teachers there, Larry Aronson, would later tell reporters with the Boston Globe, quote, He had such potential and was such a good soul. He was just a good friend to a lot of people. He was friends with all kinds of kids, regardless of background. And that was what was important to him, that network of friends, unquote. An avid sports fan and a basketball fanatic, Eric would remain close with his friends and family, and in adulthood, ultimately decided to become a bodybuilder. However, like Rafi, it is believed that Eric had an additional source of income through some minor drug dealing. In 2008, Eric was pulled over by a police officer for failing to yield, and upon leaning into Eric's window, the officer reportedly smelled marijuana. Eric immediately confessed to having a brown paper bag full of weed, and he was later charged with marijuana possession and intent to distribute. A few years later, in 2011, Eric's landlord entered his apartment while Eric was gone, and later reported his large weed stash to police. Eric was later arrested and charged with possessing weed, in addition to small amounts of cocaine and prescription drugs, but the charges were later dropped. Despite these run-ins with law enforcement, Eric was remembered as a kind-hearted, funny, and good person by almost everyone that knew him. Brendan Halley Mess was born on January 16, 1986, and, like the other two men, grew up in the Boston area. However, unlike the other two, he was not really committed to his Jewish faith, 
He did not seem to actively live according to any religious lifestyle, and he wasn't involved with any local synagogues as of 2011. A few years prior, Brendan had graduated from Champlain College with a bachelor's degree in professional writing, but made an immediate left turn after his graduation. He had become a mixed martial arts fighter, who was actually pretty well known in the area, but would better become known for his work as an MMA instructor and trainer. Brendan was mostly proficient in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, but was looking to bolster his skills, and had begun to branch out into other areas of his game, in particular boxing, as he attempted to become a more well-rounded fighter. Like Eric, Brendan was no stranger to police having been arrested in 2010 for assaulting people at a store in Waltham, where he lived, alongside another man. However, police did not know at the time that Brendan had also begun dealing drugs on the side, mostly weed, alongside his friends, Rafi and Eric. Some reports indicate that these three men, 37-year-old Rafi T. Ken, 31-year-old Eric Weissman, and 25-year-old Brendan Mess, were all living together at 12 Harding Avenue, a second-story apartment in a quiet, suburban neighborhood in Waltham. This wasn't a regular apartment building, but was more like a large house with separate apartment units, which was set back in a dead-end neighborhood. However, these three men were not roommates, at least not in the traditional sense. The apartment belonged to Brendan Mess, who had just moved there a short time before and had had roommates in the past, but did not really have any at the time. Eric had been crashing on friends' couches in the weeks leading up to September of 2011, and this did include Brendan's couch. But, as you can guess, they weren't necessarily roommates per se. In fact, in the first full week of September 2011, Eric had been forced to clear out after Brendan got into a knockdown, drag out argument with his girlfriend. An argument that ultimately resulted in the two breaking up. At least for the time. For the rest of the week, Eric ended up crashing at another friend's house, but was invited back later that weekend. On September 11th, 2011, a Sunday, Eric Weissman drove over to Brendan Mess's apartment. After staying at a friend's house in Newton for a few days, Brendan had invited him over, along with another friend of theirs, 37-year-old Rafi Tiken, who was a frequent guest at Brendan's place. They all planned on watching Sunday night football together, and were likely preparing to enjoy a drink and a smoke as they watched the New York Jets take on the Dallas Cowboys that evening. Eric arrived at Brendan's apartment at around 7.30, about an hour before the game kicked off, and upon arriving, texted his friend from Newton. From there, Brendan, Eric, and Rafi, who were friends with one another, seemed to be texting and communicating with other friends and family members over the next half an hour or so, but their communication would abruptly stop at around 8pm. They would seemingly fall out of contact with everyone they knew for the better part of an hour, before their silence was just briefly broken. At 8.54pm, Eric Weissman's cell phone placed an order for delivery with Jerry's Italian Kitchen, a pizza place in nearby Watertown. If this was Eric, then he had placed an order for meatballs, a chicken cutlet, and a side order of sausage, which was estimated to take about half an hour to arrive by the staff at Jerry's. Just 20 minutes later, at 9.14pm, a delivery woman arrived at Brendan's apartment, but no one responded to her knocks at the door. The restaurant tried calling Eric's cell phone in a secondary effort to get in touch with him, but likewise, no one answered. Police would later state their belief that whatever had happened inside of Brendan's apartment had likely happened in this vital period of time, between 8 and 9pm. The following day, Monday, September 12th, the girlfriend of Brendan Mess, who had not seen him in several days, following an explosive argument and them having actually broken up, arrived at his apartment looking for him. This girlfriend, who had actually left Waltham and had spent the last several days in Florida with her family, had been trying to get in touch with Brendan over the last few hours but had been unable to do so. She had returned to the area and was hoping to mend fences, 
so she decided to go to Brendan's apartment and speak to him directly, just in case he was ducking her calls. Since she believed that Brendan was at home, but wasn't answering his door or phone, his girlfriend asked his landlord to open up the door to his apartment. This made her the first person to enter Brendan's apartment that afternoon, just before 2.30pm, and she was the first to report what she had seen. The bodies of all three men, Brendan Mess, Rafi Tiken, and Eric Weissman, were still inside of Brendan's apartment, and had each been killed with a sharp object, such as a knife or an ice pick leaving behind the three in a bloody and chaotic scene. Brendan's girlfriend reportedly left the apartment a moment later, screaming and or crying, and authorities were immediately called to the crime scene. Police arrived at the scene a short time later, and immediately began to theorize that this crime was personal in nature. It was not, they believed, centered around robbery or any other type of similar motive. Which was made clear by the crime scene itself. For starters, the bodies of all three men, Rafi, Eric, and Brendan, were covered in thousands of dollars worth of marijuana, estimated to be roughly upwards of a pound, which had been sprinkled over their bodies. Additionally, police would easily find more than $5,000 in cash inside of the apartment, which was spread between three different rooms, indicating that the killers had not tried to search very hard for it. Secondly, the cause of death of all three men pointed to a familiarity with their killer, or killers. All three men had had their heads pulled back and their throats slit, with the cuts being reportedly so severe that all three were nearly decapitated. This was very odd, but each of the victims showed varying degrees of abuse, with Raphael Tekken, the oldest victim, showing almost no sign of violence other than his throat being cut. Eric Weissman, on the other hand, had a bloody lip, and Brendan Mess, whose apartment the bodies were found in, had bruises on his face, scratches all over his arms, and other defensive wounds, indicating that he, an established MMA fighter, had actually fought back against his killer. Thirdly, there was no sign of forced entry, so it was believed that, whoever the killers were, they had likely been let into the apartment willingly by the three victims. They were likely friends, or at the very least, acquaintances. An anonymous Waltham investigator, who later spoke to ABC News, was reported as saying, quote, There was no forced entry. It was clear that the victims had let the killer in, and their throats were slashed right out of an Al-Qaeda training video. The drugs and money on the bodies was very strange." Unquote. It was determined that none of Brendan's neighbors, including his landlord, had heard anything suspicious in the time period leading up to the discovery of the bodies. This was the evening of September 11th and the morning of September 12th, which was relatively warm in the area and had led to many of Brendan's neighbors leaving their windows open overnight. None of them had seen or heard anything suspicious. Although it would later be reported that two unidentified men had been seen at Brendan's apartment sometime the night prior, at around the time that police now believed the murders unfolded. At the time, investigators believed that drugs played a likely part in the murders, but not in the way that you might think. It was not believed that the killer of these three men had intended to steal any of the drugs, but rather the sprinkling of marijuana over the bodies indicated some other kind of deep-seated motivation, possibly related to the drug trade itself or the killer's disapproval of the victim's prior actions. Due to the crime scene itself, it was believed that there had been more than one killer. This was especially resonant when it was learned that all three of the victims, who found work as a physical trainer, a bodybuilder, and a mixed martial artist respectively, would be incredibly hard to subdue at the same time. Someone doing so without the threat of a firearm, perhaps several firearms, was unlikely. Based on witness sightings, it was believed that at least two men had participated in the killings, and had fled from the scene shortly after murdering Brendan, Eric, and Rafi. It was believed 
that the killer had intentionally targeted the victims, and investigators seemed to rule out this being a random crime entirely. There was a slight possibility that ethnicity or religion did play a part in the murders, as all three men were Jewish, despite one of the victims, Brendan Mess, not really practicing Judaism at the time. But it was believed that this might have just been a coincidence. It was more than likely to police at the time that drugs had played a role in the murders, since all three men were believed to have been dealing drugs at the time, primarily marijuana, and it was later theorized that Brendan and Eric had been planning on expanding their enterprise in the near future. Perhaps they had run afoul of some other local dealers, who had killed the men to send a message to other rivals. As you can imagine, police did not really have a lot of suspects on the horizon, at least not originally. Brendan Mess's girlfriend, who had last seen Brendan the week before the murders, had gotten into a dispute with him which resulted in them breaking up. However, it was later reported that their breakup had actually turned violent, with her throwing bottles and even knives at him before leaving the area. After their breakup, she had left Waltham and had gone to visit some family down in Florida, before returning on the 12th, when she discovered the bodies inside of Brendan's apartment. Friends of Brendan told police and reporters about their violent breakup, and expressed concern that she might have had something to do with the murders. Some of Brendan's acquaintances theorized that she had organized the murder, and that Rafi and Eric, the other two victims, were just collateral damage. Friends of Brendan's that she had never really gotten along with. However, Brendan's girlfriend was quickly eliminated as a suspect, as police would find nothing linking her to the crimes. She had been out of town at the time, and had not returned until September 12th. There was nothing pointing to her having played a part in the crimes whatsoever. A second suspect would emerge roughly 11 days after the murders, in the form of Brendan's 19-year-old neighbor, who was arrested for threatening strangers with a knife and demanding, quote, give me your weed, unquote. At the time, this young man had been wearing a mask, and he would reportedly later threaten to kill a friend of his. However, police wrote off this kid as harmless, a local hooligan whose bark was bigger than his bite, who did not really have the ability or know-how to subdue three physically imposing men. Despite sounding like an absolute nightmare of a human being, he was cleared as a suspect as well. Police would interview several people close to the victims, including their friends, family members, and colleagues but were ultimately unable to make any inroads in the coming months. The case would quickly go cold, despite the victim's loved ones providing the police with the names of several potential suspects. None of these friends or family recall the local police ever following up on their tips, not even one name that would become internationally known a short time later. In fact, one of the victim's family members would recall hearing from a detective that police were simply waiting for someone to come forward with a confession, as they believed that the case would simply solve itself in due time. Mind you, this was roughly one week after the murders, when the leads were still fresh and could be followed up on. But police inactivity seemed to doom this case to cold case status before the victims' bodies could even be buried. Roughly a year and a half would pass before the story exploded in a major way, and everything that had been publicly speculated about it was flipped on its head. Now, we're going to pause for just a moment to hear a word from today's sponsor. We're now officially in 2020, and one of my New Year's resolutions is to take better care of myself, as well as better manage my personal finances. To help me with both of these goals, I'm turning to Harry's. Harry's knows that a great shave doesn't come from flex balls or heated handles, but rather quality craftsmanship at a fair price. Harry's team has combined a simple ergonomic design with five sharp blades, sourcing their steel from Sweden and manufacturing their blades at their world-class factory in Germany. And they have even cut out the middleman to ship directly to you, saving you both time and money. Harry's has a 100% quality guarantee and stands fully behind their products. If you don't love your shave, let them know and they'll give you a full refund. That's customer service you can't buy, folks. Harry's has a special offer for listeners of my show. New customers get $5 off of a trial set at harrys.com unresolved. 
By taking advantage of this offer, you'll get a 5-blade razor, a weighted handle, foaming shave gel with aloe, and a travel cover. Join the millions of guys and gals who have already switched, and go to harrys.com slash unresolved to claim your offer today. Once again, that's harrys.com slash unresolved. H-A-R-R-Y-S dot com slash unresolved. Now, without any further ado, let's return to the program. On April 15th, 2013, on a holiday known as Patriots Day in the Boston area, the 117th Boston Marathon was taking place. More than 23,000 runners participated in that year's event, with the marathon itself kicking off at 9.17 a.m. Eastern Time, and competitors being released in three waves over the next 40 or so minutes. Winners would start to arrive at the marathon's finish line a little over two hours later, just around noon, and would be followed over the next few hours by thousands of other runners that had finished the 26-mile course. At around 2.49 p.m., as hundreds of surveyors huddled around the finish line, anticipating the arrival of other runners. An explosion occurred nearby. This would be followed by a subsequent blast about 15 seconds later, which went off roughly one block west, only 190 meters away. is very, very preliminary, and right now the federal government is just getting ramped up in the sense of getting all of its command centers and control rooms together to try to figure out what this is. The preliminary cut of information, and I emphasize capital P preliminary, there are about a dozen people hurt, that's the first word back to the federal government, about a dozen people hurt, no confirmed fatalities right now. So far, and we don't know whether this was an accident, a natural gas explosion, or something more sinister, uh, there have been no claims of any kind of responsibility. That doesn't necessarily mean anything, but as a starting point, uh, a high-ranking official in the government told me just a moment, moment ago that there have been no claims of responsibility. This is a very fluid situation. The information undoubtedly is going to change many, many times over the coming hours, Scott, and we're efforting uh, more information as we go. Over the next several hours, the fallout from the two explosions would be felt, not just through the Boston area, but throughout America and even the rest of the world. The two explosions had stoked the fears of fire that had been mostly dormant in America since September 11th, 2001. All in all, three people had been killed by the explosions and another 264 had been wounded. Because so many people were affected by the blast, the wounded had to be treated at 27 local hospitals, and a large-scale investigation was quickly launched to find the responsible parties. Meanwhile, on websites like Reddit, amateur web sleuths embarked on a poorly conceived witch hunt to try and identify the bombers for themselves, as news affiliates shared their findings without any real foresight. Needless to say, the event, which was the largest act of terrorism in America since 9-11, had people scared and desperately searching for answers. Hoping to calm people down, President Barack Obama would address the press just hours after the bombing. We're continuing to monitor and respond uh, to the situation as it unfolds, and I've directed the full resources of the federal government to help state and local authorities protect our people increase security around the United States as necessary, and investigate what happened. The American people will say a prayer for Boston tonight, and Michelle and I send our deepest thoughts and prayers to the families of the victims in the wake of this senseless loss. We don't yet have all the answers, but we do know that multiple people have been wounded, some gravely, in explosions at the Boston Marathon. I've spoken to FBI Director Mueller and Secretary of Homeland Security Napolitano, and they're mobilizing the appropriate resources to investigate and to respond. I've updated leaders of Congress in both parties, and we reaffirm that on days like this there are no Republicans or Democrats, 
We are Americans united in concern for our fellow citizens. I've also spoken with Governor Patrick and Mayor Menino and made it clear that they have every single federal resource necessary to care for the victims and counsel the families. And above all, I made clear to them that all Americans stand with the people of Boston. Boston police, firefighters, and first responders, as well as the National Guard, responded heroically and continue to do so as we speak. It's a reminder that so many Americans serve and sacrifice on our behalf every single day, without regard to their own safety, in dangerous and difficult circumstances. And we salute all those who assisted in responding so quickly and professionally to this tragedy. We still do not know who did this or why. And people shouldn't jump to conclusions before we have all the facts. But make no mistake, we will get to the bottom of this. And we will find out who did this. We'll find out why they did this. Any, respons uh, any responsible individuals, uh, any responsible groups will feel the full weight of justice. Today is a holiday in Massachusetts, Patriots Day. It's a day that celebrates the free and fiercely independent spirit that this great American city of Boston has reflected from the earliest days of our nation. And it's a day that draws the world to Boston streets in a spirit of friendly competition. Boston is a tough and resilient town. So are its people. I'm supremely confident that Bostonians will pull together, take care of each other, and move forward as one proud city. And as they do, the American people will be with them every single step of the way. Uh, you should anticipate that as we get more information, uh, our teams will uh, provide you briefings. Uh, we're still in the investigation stage at this point, uh, but I just want to reiterate, uh, we will find out who did this, and we will hold them accountable. Thank you very much. Utilizing witness statements and surveillance images of the bombing sites, police were able to identify two suspects within a period of days. 26-year-old Tomerlan Sarnayev and his younger brother, 19-year-old Johar. Both were Chechen Americans, born during the collapse of the Soviet Union, having spent their youth in Kyrgyzstan. They had later obtained asylum in the United States and moved with their families to Cambridge, Massachusetts, where they would ultimately become permanent U.S. residents. Photos of the two brothers were released to the press on the afternoon of April 18th, 2013, three days after the bombing at the Boston Marathon. Knowing that their life of anonymity was quickly expiring, the two brothers decided to go out in a blaze of glory, and sought to quickly obtain money and resources in order to pull off a similar bombing plot in New York City's Times Square. They would shoot and kill an MIT security guard named Sean Collier, hoping to steal his firearm, which they were unsuccessful in doing so. They then carjacked an SUV from a Chinese national named Dun Meng, who was known as Danny to his friends. The Sarnayev brothers held Danny hostage in his own vehicle for a short period of time, and even made him withdraw $800 from a local ATM. As they prepared to make their way to New York City, they stopped by a Shell gas station, where their hostage, Danny, was able to make his escape. He ran across the street to a neighboring gas station, and there, asked the clerk to dial 911, unbeknownst to the Sarnayev brothers. Danny Meng had left his cell phone inside of his SUV, and police were able to use its GPS to track the hijackers, who they suspected were the bombing suspects. Over the next several hours, police would track the two brothers as they attempted to make their getaway. Police were ultimately able to triangulate their position, and this led to a shootout between the Tsarnaev brothers and law enforcement agencies, such as local university and transit police, as well as the Massachusetts State Police. The two brothers, who had an arsenal of guns and homemade explosives at their disposal, attempted to shoot their way to freedom. One police officer, Dennis Simmons of the Boston PD, would be killed in the ensuing struggle, and 15 other officers would be injured or wounded. But among the carnage left behind at this crime scene was Tomerlan Tsarnaev, the oldest of the two, who was believed to have been the ringleader of the terror plot. He had been fatally wounded in the firefight with police, and would die just hours later in a local hospital. Meanwhile, his younger brother, 19-year-old Johar Tsarnaev, 
would go on the lam, as numerous law enforcement agencies scoured the area of Watertown, Massachusetts. Several hours would pass before it was learned that the teenaged terrorist had taken refuge in a resident's boat, which was parked in his backyard. Johar was finally taken into custody on the evening of April 19th, 2013, after exchanging gunfire with police yet again. He was treated for his wounds and was officially charged with more than two dozen crimes just a few days later, on April 22nd. Crimes that he would plead not guilty to. After a long and arduous process lasting almost two years, Johar Sarnaev was found guilty of all 30 counts in 2015 and was later sentenced to death. He has appealed his penalty in the years since but has been unsuccessful in doing so, and to this day, he has been held in a supermax prison awaiting an execution date. So I bet you're probably wondering why I just detailed the seemingly unrelated story of the Boston Marathon bombing. Well, I wanted to tell this story to establish some context for what happens next, because this story happens to directly correlate with the story we have been covering today so far the 2011 murder from Waltham, Massachusetts. However, before I get into how exactly these two stories intersect, I need to back up just a little bit. Back to the mid-2000s, when one of the two Boston bombers, Tomerlan Sarnaev, the supposed ringleader of the marathon bombing, was beginning to come of age in the Boston region. Despite dying in a shootout with police in April of 2013, and never being named a Waltham suspect while he was alive, Tomerlon's backstory would provide a lot of context for the still unsolved murders of Brendan Mess, Rafi Tiken, and Eric Weissman. In 2008, Tomerlon Tsarnaev, who had been studying accounting at Bunker Hill Community College with the hopes of one day becoming an engineer, decided to drop out of school entirely and begin pursuing boxing as a career. Throughout the rest of the year, Tomerlon would begin to dedicate himself to boxing, while also becoming more of a devout Muslim. This year, he would begin attending a mosque near his home in Cambridge, and according to friends that knew him both before and after, he would stop drinking alcohol and smoking weed entirely. He would begin to grow radicalized during this time period, a gradual process that started in 2008 but never really ended until his death roughly five years later. 2008 is also when Tomerlon became known for using violence to solve his problems. A proficient young boxer, he would begin using violence against his two sisters' love interest when he believed that his sisters had been mistreated. In at least one case, he beat up his younger sister's boyfriend simply because he wasn't a Muslim. In 2009, Tomerlon began to show his prowess inside of the boxing ring. Known as a hard-hitting fighter, he would become the New England Golden Gloves heavyweight champion, which was a testament to his skills. However, he would also begin to express some more erratic behavior outside of the ring, and in 2009 he was arrested for aggravated domestic assault and battery. Police had been called to the scene of an argument with his then-girlfriend, and Tomerlon admitted to police that he had slapped his girlfriend. However, the charges were later dropped and the case was dismissed, so Tomerlon faced no real repercussions. Later that year, when he had started dating another young woman, friends and acquaintances would recall him being an incredibly abusive individual who repeatedly referred to his girlfriend as a quote-unquote slut. However, their relationship would carry on for the next several years, and she would eventually convert to Islam and would later give birth to Tomerlan's only child, a daughter, in 2010. It was also in this time period that Tomerlan began to grow close to another local fighter, a name that you listeners might be familiar with, Brendan Mess, a local MMA fighter that specialized in Brazilian jiu-jitsu became one of Tomerlon's closest friends and his sparring partner. Since Tomerlon was a well-known boxer, and Brendan was a proficient grappler, the two provided a perfect counterbalance for one another, and they could each learn something from the other in the sparring ring. Tomerlon and Brendan had already known each other for quite a while, but in this time period, they began to grow extremely close. 
and they were both spending a lot of time around one another. According to people in their social circle, they even lived together for a period of time, and many would later recall that the two considered the other their best friend. Throughout 2010, the friendship between Tomerlan Tsarnaev and Brenton Mess would continue to blossom, and they would continue to spar in boxing and wrestling matches. Both men were hoping to transition their talents into MMA, and hopefully, one day compete in the UFC. Brendan would even drag around the awkward Tomerlon to social outings, often introducing him as just Tom. Despite this though, Tsarnaev had fallen further and further into his extremist views, and had become a follower of more radical Islamic beliefs. This eventually led to Russia's Federal Security Service contacting the FBI, informing them that Tomerlon was making plans to visit Russia. They told the Bureau that Tomerlon had most likely become radicalized, and was probably planning on joining an underground terrorist organization while traveling overseas. The FBI reportedly investigated the claims, conducting an interview with Tomerlon himself and probing his background, but they did not seem to find any link worth following up on. Russia's FSB apparently refused to cooperate any further and release more incriminating evidence, so the case was then closed for the time being. Later in the year, however, friends began to notice some discord between Tomerlon and Brendan Mess, his best friend and former roommate. Friends and relatives of the two would later note that Tomerlon had expressed disapproval over Brendan's lifestyle choices, likely his consumption of marijuana and alleged drug dealing, and some have even theorized that Brendan might have even sold weed to Tomerlon's younger brother, the then teenaged Johar, who would begin attending the University of Massachusetts Dartmouth that September, and who was known as a bit of a pothead among his own friends. Despite this obvious tension, the two did not really have any known arguments or public blowups, and from the outside looking in, seemed to still be friends. That is, until September 12th, 2011, when the bodies of Brendan Mess, Eric Weissman, and Raphael Tiken were found inside of Brendan's apartment, having had their throats slit and marijuana sprinkled over their bodies. Tomerlan Sarnaev, who had been Brendan's best friend in the months and years leading up to the heinous crime, seemed to express no real sadness over Brendan's murder, or really any emotion at all. A friend of Brendan's that knew Tomerlon, who was identified as just Ray in the press, spoke to BuzzFeed a few years later and stated, quote, Tom wasn't there at the memorial service, he wasn't at the funeral, he wasn't around at all, and he was really close with Brendan. He was somebody who was in contact with Brendan on a daily basis. Anybody like that, you would think they would have been around, unquote. Following Brendan's murder, Tomerlon Tsarnaev seemed to cut off contact with many of the people he had met and knew through Brendan, and simply stopped showing up at the gym they had constantly sparred in. He would seem to laugh off Brendan's death with others, virtually shrugging off the friendship that had bloomed between the two over the past several years. He seemed totally disaffected by Brendan's death and would actually disappear shortly thereafter. In January of 2012, roughly three months after the Waltham triple murder, Tomerlan Tsarnaev traveled to Russia, where he would live for the next six months. Not much is known about this trip, but it is believed that he became even more radicalized during this half-year period, and it is widely accepted from intelligence bureaus that he probably received training from underground terrorists during this time span. In July of 2012, Tsarnaev returned to the United States, and appeared to have become a true Islamic extremist, even to his family, who recall the changes in him as being very pronounced. He would live quietly off of the grid for a short period of time, but began to become argumentative and confrontational with those he viewed as being less committed to Islam than him. Then, as you know, just months later, in March of 2013, his long-awaited terror plot would begin to unfold in Boston. Just days after exploding two homemade bombs at the marathon, Tomerlon would be killed by law enforcement, ending his story forever.
Following the death of Tomerlan Tsarnaev and the arrest of his brother, Johar, police began to circle back around to them as suspects in the 2011 Waltham triple murder. The two brothers, now known internationally as terrorists, had gone unexplored as suspects in the unsolved cold case until that point, March of 2013, roughly a year and a half later. And it wasn't really until the Boston Globe released a full profile of the brothers the week after the Marathon bombing that connections between them and the Waltham victims became publicly known. This is in spite of Tomerlan Tsarnaev being widely known as murder victim Brendan Mess's best friend, and his name being given to homicide detectives as far back as September of 2011, more than 18 months before the Boston Marathon bombing. It was soon learned that the FBI had interviewed Tomerlan back in 2011, prior to the murders, and they had theorized back then that he had started to become radicalized well before his trip to Russia the following year, which conveniently took place just a few months after the murders, allowing Tomerlan to leave the area until the case had gone cold. For the first time, authorities began to investigate both Tomerlan and his brother, Johar, as suspects in the murder. They believed that the two likely had some knowledge of the crime and might have even been the two unidentified men seen by witnesses at Brendan's apartment on the night of the murders. As far as evidence linking the brothers to the crime scene, however, not much could be found. There was an obvious link in the form of Jerry's Italian Kitchen, the pizza place that murder victim Eric Weissman had supposedly ordered food from on the night of the murders. Police had long suspected that Eric himself had not placed the order, due to the time in which it happened, 8.54pm, and the failure of him or anyone present to answer the door or receive the food just 20 minutes later. Roughly one week after the Boston Marathon bombing, officials were alerted to the discovery of discarded fireworks inside of donation bins in the parking lot of Jerry's Italian Kitchen. The fireworks had actually had their gunpowder removed and authorities believe that the gunpowder had been used inside of the Sarnayev brothers' explosives. It was later reported that both brothers had actually worked as pizza delivery drivers in the past, and this connection to Jerry's Italian kitchen provided a fascinating lead. Other evidence came in the form of cell phone records from September 11th, 2011 which seemed to indicate both Sarnayev brothers being in the area of the murders at the time in which they happened. Additionally, it was believed that the date of the murders itself, the 10-year anniversary of 9-11, might have provided some kind of impetus for Tomerlan to act, as he had been becoming more and more radicalized in the preceding months. It is unknown if police were able to learn anything from Johar, the lone surviving Boston bomber, whose face had been plastered all over every newspaper and magazine in the country. He has been held in almost solitary confinement in the years since, and very little information about his interviews with authorities has been released in the years since. However, it was learned that in the time period before the bombing, the two Sarnayev brothers had been spotted alongside a third man, who Tomerlan had once referred to as his other brother, who also seemed to be an MMA fighter with ties to Russia. This, along with Tomerlan's phone records, would eventually lead police to another young man named Ibrahim Todeshev, who was not believed to have played a part in the Boston bombing itself, but would become an integral part of this story moving forward. Ibrahim Todeshev was a 27-year-old Chechen American who, like the Tsarnaev brothers, had immigrated to the US from Russia as a young man. And like Tomerlan, Ibrahim was an amateur boxer and aspiring MMA fighter who had had to set aside those aspirations due to a knee injury. Before then though, he had actually been friends with Tomerlan and had trained with and sparred with him in the same Boston area gyms frequented by Brenton Mess. Ibrahim Todeshev had lived in Boston for a period of years, but at around the time of the Waltham murders, he had relocated to Atlanta, Georgia, and then, a short time later, to Orlando, Florida. Following the bombing of the Boston Marathon, federal investigators began to surveil Ibrahim and interviewed him as a suspect and or accomplice, not just in the terror plot, but the still unsolved 2011 triple murder. Perhaps feeling the pressure of a federal investigation, Ibrahim decided to book passage back to Russia in May of 2013, less than two months after the Boston Marathon bombing. But on May 22nd, 
just two days before Ibrahim's scheduled flight. Federal investigators arrived at his apartment in Orlando. They began talking to him for what would turn into a several hour interview, in which they would probe Ibrahim about his friendship to Boston bomber Tomerlan Tsarnaev, as well as his potential ties to the unsolved Waltham murders. This included his unknown relationship with murder victim Brendan Mess, who often frequented the same gyms as Tomerlan and Ibrahim, and they all had actually lived in the same neighborhood neighborhood. According to FBI agent Aaron McFarland, who was conducting the interview alongside two police officers with the Massachusetts State Police, after several hours, Ibrahim started to confess to his involvement in the Waltham murders, claiming that he had acted alongside Tomerlan Tsarnaev in carrying out the brutal crime. Just after midnight, he was apparently ready to write out and sign a full formal statement, which would implicate himself and Tomerlan in the murders. Ibrahim provided details about the murders, confessing to a series of events that started with a misguided robbery plot orchestrated by Tom Erlon. He claimed that Tom, as he was known, had encouraged him to rob Brendan's apartment alongside him, and that the two had gained entry into the apartment at gunpoint. Once inside, they used their firearms to subdue the three men, and then Tom Erlon, fearing that he would be identified, made the decision to kill all three. Afterwards, Ibrahim confessed. He and Tomerlan had spent upwards of an hour in Brendan's apartment, attempting to clean up the crime scene and remove evidence of themselves having been there, such as fingerprints. They then stole thousands of dollars, which they would split between them. Like I said, Ibrahim Todeshev had apparently confessed to this series of events verbally, and was prepared to write down or sign off on a more comprehensive statement inside of his apartment. However, the law enforcement agents at the scene say that before he could sign off on this confession, Ibrahim actually attacked them, using his physical prowess and the element of surprise to nearly overpower them. And in the chaotic moments that would follow, Ibrahim would be shot and killed by the police officers at the scene. The specific series of events that unfolded that evening remains a point of contention today, with many doubting the validity of the official narrative. Ibrahim's loved ones have since put forth conspiracy theories about Ibrahim being murdered by law enforcement, whom they allege used this half-baked confession as a kind of cover story. These theories have only fermented in the odd corners of the internet due to the FBI's relative secrecy over the event, but has kept the details of the shooting rather clouded in the years since. Nonetheless, 27-year-old Ibrahim Todeshev, who had apparently confessed to involvement in the 2011 Waltham triple murder just minutes prior, was dead, and his death would only end up creating more questions than answers. To this day, federal and local investigators have not really clarified their beliefs on the matter. Whether or not they believe that Tomerlan Tsarnaev and Ibrahim Todeshev were the killers of Brendan Mess, Rafi Tiken, and Eric Weissman, or if they believe that Tomerlan's younger brother, Johar, who has been held in federal custody at ADX Florence since June of 2015, was involved in any way, shape, or form. Despite Ibrahim Todeshev seeming to admit to the crime in May of 2013, just before he was shot dead by federal agents, after he reportedly lunged at and attacked them, his confession itself seems to be less than definitive. Journalist Susan Zalkind with the Boston Magazine wrote a superb long-form article about Ibrahim's potential involvement, which detailed not only his background, but the confession he had given to police. She points out that, in multiple ways, Ibrahim's confession seems to conflict directly with the known facts of the case. Namely, during his confession, Ibrahim told authorities that the three murder victims from Waltham had been bound with tape, which, as far as anyone knows, isn't true. None of the victims' friends or families had ever heard this detail before, and it is unknown whether or not the victims had been bound at any point prior to their murders. In his confession, Ibrahim also gave no inclination to a physical altercation 
soon taking place. Despite two of the three victims showing physical injuries, scratches and bruises, defensive wounds, etc. He also provided no information about the murder weapon, only ever telling investigators that Tomerlon and himself had used guns to coax the victims onto the ground. Additionally, Ibrahim referred to the murders almost as a robbery gone wrong, when police ruled out robbery as a motive almost immediately after the discovery of the bodies. More than eight and a half pounds of marijuana had been left inside of Brendan's apartment, and some of it had actually been sprinkled over the bodies. Additionally, investigators found more than $5,000 in cash at the apartment, which seems to rule against robbery being the killer's motive whatsoever. There has even been some contention over whether or not Ibrahim Todeshev was in the Boston area at the time of the murders. He had been living there through the summer, but claims to have moved to Atlanta with his wife by September 11th, a detail that his loved ones stick by today. This raises the possibility that maybe, somehow, Ibrahim had simply learned about the murders through his friendship with Tomerlon, and simply conveyed that information to police before his death. Honestly, I don't really know what to make of Ibrahim's unfinished confession, and I would encourage everyone listening to do some research of their own into the matter. It's truly a bizarre story, and I wish that I could simply articulate my confusing thoughts about it, at least without sounding like a whack job. Despite refusing to say anything truly definitive about the case over the years, Investigators have stated repeatedly that they believe Tomerlan Tsarnaev, the orchestrator of the Boston Marathon bombing, was involved in some way. If he was involved, it was probable that his crime symbolized more than just the dissolution of a friendship, but included other factors that were likely important to Tomerlan. This included his descent into Islamic extremism, in which case, the date of the murders being the 10-year anniversary of 9-11 likely played a part. The spreading of marijuana over the bodies, to symbolize Tomerlan's disapproval of their lifestyle, and likely even the fact that all three of the victims were Jewish, which is hard to overlook. Some have even theorized that this violent act might have been Tomerlon's way of saying goodbye to his past, while also committing himself to the violent extremism that would ultimately define his life a year and a half later. Some have even pointed out that Brendan Mess's girlfriend, whom he had broken up with just days before the murder, was also Muslim. Perhaps Tomerlon had caught wind of their breakup, and maybe this was the straw that broke the camel's back. That maybe the thing that made Tomerlon lash out at a former friend was likely disrespecting a Muslim woman. We know that Tomerlon had lashed out physically at others in the years for disrespecting his sisters, and knowing what we know now about how radicalized he had become, this fact wouldn't surprise me. In the years since the deaths of both Tomerlan Tsarnaev and Ibrahim Todeshev, police have indicated that there is physical evidence linking at least one of the men to the crime scene, hinting at DNA from the murder scene matching Tomerlan's genetic profile. However, the specific details of this information have not ever been released publicly, and the findings of the nearly decade-long investigation remain highly guarded to this day. Close to nine years later, the 2011 Waltham triple murder is still officially unsolved, and has become, by all definitions, a cold case. There has been some absolutely wonderful reporting done on this story, some of which you've heard me reference throughout the episode. This includes some wonderful reports from the Boston Globe and Boston Magazine, as well as larger media outlets like NPR, ABC, CBS, CNN, and so many more. This American Life even released a really thorough episode about the story back in 2014, which I've intentionally tried to avoid over the years so that it wouldn't influence the writing of this episode. Despite all of the great Great work from reporters. The triple murder from Waltham is still unsolved, with local police and the FBI having cooperated on the case ever since Tomerlan Tsarnaev's involvement was first speculated back in 2013. To this day, he and Ibrahim Todeshev are still the only publicly named suspects, despite both being deceased, but it is believed that others might have been involved or have knowledge of the case until they are publicly identified, or come forward willingly. It is unlikely that any charges will be filed, or answers found for the victims and their loved ones. I feel bad for having spent so much time in this episode covering the stories of Tomerlan Tsarnaev, as well as his friend, Ibrahim Todeshev, 
both of whom are only suspected of involvement, and are unable to be charged with any crimes. But tragically, there is just so much information out there about those two, and how their lives intersected with the victims, that it's really hard not to fall down the rabbit hole. I tried to condense their stories as much as I could, and I think you all know how much I enjoy a good conspiracy, but this one is almost too much to wrap my brain around. There's just so much out there that's worth exploring, and I would really encourage anyone listening to read up on the case for themselves. There's just so much out there, and I really feel like this episode barely scratches the surface of the overall craziness. I truly wish that this episode could have been more centered around the three victims, who were, by all accounts, good men, who lived truly blameless lives. All three have since been put to rest by their loved ones. Their friends and family continue to live on, hoping that answers, which have proven to be incredibly elusive over the past eight plus years, can be found in the near future. Until more information is released about this incredibly confusing case, the stories of Raphael Tiken, Eric Weissman, and Brendan Mess will remain unresolved. Thank you for listening to Unresolved. I have been your host, Michael Whelan, and I am responsible for researching, writing, recording, and producing what you've been listening to. The music throughout the episode was composed by myself through Amber Music, with the exception being the song you're hearing now, which is the Unresolved theme song, written and composed by my friend, Ailsa Traves. To learn more about the podcast, just search for Unresolved online. You can find our website at unresolved.me, and we do have social media accounts on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. I haven't been very active over there lately, but I'm hoping to get back into the swing of things. You can also head to patreon.com slash unresolved pod if you feel like supporting this show and get access to the cool perks we offer there. As I mentioned in the last episode, I'm still struggling to catch up after a busy end to 2019, but I do have a lot of really exciting things planned for bonus episodes and whatnot, so patrons, please stay tuned. Before I wrap up this episode, I would like to thank the wonderful producers of Unresolved, who support this show each month through Patreon. These producers are Maggie James, Ben Crocom, Roberta Jansen, Matthew Brock, Quill Carter, Peggy Bellarda, Laura Hannon, Evan White, Catherine Vatolaro, Damian Moore, Astrid Nyer, Amy Hampton, Emily McMeehan, Scott Neesey, Stephen Wilson, Sam Aubard, Scott Patzold, Marie Vangland, Lori Rodriguez, Jessica Yount, Amy McGregor, Danny Williams, Sue Kirk, Sarah Mascaratolo, Thomas Ahern, Victoria Reed, Marion Welsh, Seth Morgan, Brian Rollins, Lauren Harris, Alyssa Lawton, Kelly Jo Hapgood, Patrick... You'll just be Patrick. You have a lot of names that I will probably butcher. Apologies, thank you. Rebecca Miller and Sydney Scotton. Thank you all so, so much. Thank you all for listening and for supporting Unresolved over the past four plus years. It still blows my mind that people are out there listening and I cannot thank you all enough. I'll be back incredibly soon with another episode, but until then, stay safe and I will talk to you later.